Welcome back to another episode of Swamp Stories. For this episode, we head back in time and across the country. But before we get into it, make sure to leave a like and subscribe if you're new. You can also follow the Instagram page as well to request videos. So let's get into it. Atlanta, Georgia, a city of prosperity, entrepreneurs, small businesses, and thriving families. That's what Atlanta is known for these days, but it wasn't always this way. So let's head back to the 1990s. Atlanta looked like a completely different city, and anyone who was around can vouch. But you might be thinking, yes, every city changes what's new. But no, this is way different. Let me break it down. Atlanta had 37 public housing complexes, which is the most per capita of any city in America. The city's landscape looked completely different than it does today. All of those fancy condos and apartment buildings that you see today used to be some of the most dangerous housing projects in the country. But how did this happen? 1994. The city of Atlanta had gotten so bad that the federal government decided to step in and take over the Atlanta Housing Authority. They would launch a program called the Hope. This plan to demolish all 37 complexes throughout the city. So starting in 1994, this would all begin. Residents would get the notice on the door saying that it's time to pack your bags and leave. But where do these people go? Well, the city would give the residents something called Section 8 housing vouchers, meaning that they can keep paying their same rent and they can choose where they want to live. It's really a win-win for the residents, right? The head of the project would even celebrate that these residents can now move to upscale communities like Buffalo. Buckhead, Midtown, or Lennox. But that's not what happened at all. Atlanta landlords were not accepting these vouchers even though they would receive tax credits. So pretty much they had every incentive to do it, but nope, they were not budging. So tens of thousands of these Atlanta residents began looking elsewhere. And what they found out is that plenty of cities would gladly accept their vouchers. Decatur, Panthersville, Forest Park, Riverdale, East Point, and many more middle-class suburban and country towns would begin filling up with former public housing residents. In fact, in the 1990s, Atlanta lost over 100,000 residents. And as more and more people began moving out to the east and south of Atlanta, these areas began to change very quickly. And that brings us to the new Atlanta. Although the borders of the city never officially changed, all of these outside areas are now known as Atlanta. And most importantly, have the same credibility as the city itself. So as the landscape of the city is changing, a whole new wave of rappers start emerging. So now let's talk about what you came here for. One of the biggest rivalries in rap history, but more importantly, two of Atlanta's biggest bosses bumping heads. But before they were bosses, they started off at the bottom. So let's head back to the start. First, let me introduce you to a young man named Jay Jenkins. He grew up about two hours south of Atlanta in a small town called Hawkinsville, Georgia. And Hawkinsville is famous for absolutely nothing. It's your typical rural small town with one major issue, poverty. And like many others in Hawkinsville, Jay grew up in a trailer park with a mother who was struggling financially and with sobriety. So at a young age, Jay began hustling to make money and he was really good at it. But one day his friends connect him with some new clients. So he walks in their trap and that's where he sees his mom laying on the couch. At this moment, Jay is affected in two ways. First, seeing his mom in that condition and secondly, knowing that she's a client of his own friends. So Jay decides to take it on the chin by realizing that money is the motive at the end of the day. And after this moment, he would go harder and harder, but then reality would hit. In 1997, at 16 years old, Jay would get arrested and sent to a boot camp for nine months. And at this boot camp, absolutely zero progress would be made. That's because he would be roommates with another teenager named Demetrius Ellerby, also known as Kink. Kink would either be the worst or the best person for Jay to meet depending on how you look at it. That's because Kink was just like him, except in a bigger area called Macon, Georgia. So anything that Jay was making in Hawkinsville, Kink was tripling that in Macon. So after the nine months at the boot camp, the two would go their separate ways. And during this time, Jay would completely take over the South Georgia region. He was reportedly touching millions of dollars before the age of 20. But despite the success, his eyes were set on way bigger dreams. So a couple of years later, he would link back up with Kink. And mind you, Kink is getting a ton of money at this time as well. But their business plans had nothing to do with the streets. They would start a music label called Corporate Thugs Entertainment, also known as CTE. Jay would even build a studio where young artists could record for them. 
and soon enough they have a star in their hands. But sadly, he would get caught up and receive a life sentence. So here they are with tons of cash, a record label, but no artists. So there's only one solution left. Let's try to rap. So Jay would hop in the studio and began calling himself Young Jeezy. And through his connections in the streets, he would drop a serious bag on features from Lil Jon and other mainstream rappers. And again, let me make this clear. Young Jeezy was rich before he ever picked up a microphone. He was already all through Atlanta in Ferraris with hundreds of thousands of dollars in chains. He would become an underground star in Atlanta, but he wasn't the only person getting serious money. So that takes us to Zone 6. And that's just what it's called because technically it's the city of Decatur. But this is one of those areas that had a huge influx of residents from Atlanta's old projects. And because of this, most of the area became just just as wild as the old Atlanta. And that's where Gucci Man began taking the same path as Young Jeezy. But his upbringing was slightly different, so let's head back. He didn't grow up rich or anything, but his mother is a college graduate and school teacher in Atlanta. And because of this, he was a good student for most of his childhood. But during his teenage years, he began getting sidetracked from school as his hustling ways started. It all started at 14 while he was getting a snack from the gas station. He runs into a cute girl and she asks him if he wants hey, to, let's say, this? inhale and exhale with her. He had never done it before, but he figured that he had to say yeah. And from that day, everything in his life would change. He became known for getting money at that same gas station on Boulder Crest Road. And at first, he had no issues. Money was fast and no one was bothering him. But things would begin to change once the money got bigger. And that takes us to 1995. It's a normal winter day after school and Roderick is doing what he does. A man approaches him and asks him if he would work for him. And by work, you know exactly what I mean. But Roderick is happy with the guys that he gets money with, so he declines the offer. Three hours later, Gucci Man is hustling behind the car wash on Boulder Crest Road. He hears something and turns around. Boom! Right there behind him is the man that he had just met earlier. He tells Roderick to give him everything, and they both know exactly what everything means. The man already knows knows who he is and definitely knows what he has in his possession. But for whatever reason, Roderick takes a risk. He is not going to give up his work, so instead he hands the man $40 in his wallet. But that's not what the man is looking for. A decision like that can cost him his existence. But thankfully the man doesn't go inside his pockets and dips off. So Roderick goes back to his wall plug and tells him the entire story. Except he lies about one thing. He tells the wall charger that the man took his you know what. So the man feels bad and gives him $400 dollars so he can get back on his feet. So at the end of the day, Gucci really finessed the situation. Only in Atlanta, for real. But this wouldn't be the last time that he would get tested. But this time, Gucci knows one thing. He can't do everything alone. So he begins rolling with a friend named Otis Williams Jr., also known as OJ to Juice Man. Together, they would attend McNair High School. For those who don't know, this high school is notorious for serving three areas, East Atlanta, Decatur, and Panthersville. And because of this, tensions between students are very high. And that takes us to May of 1997. It's the last week of school and a food fight breaks out between different groups in the cafeteria. Gucci gets food splattered all across his shirt, so he slowly gets up and boom! He slaps the guy who threw the food. Everyone freezes. That's because the kid he just hit is from a group called the East Joel's Boys. This is a large group of guys who claim the Panthersville area, but Gucci does not care one bit. That's because they're from Panthersville, which used to be the suburbs. But Gucci would be met with a big surprise. The East Shoals boys are with everything he's with. And for the next year, many altercations and incidents would occur. Gucci would head down to Panthersville, and in return, they would leave his close friend Javon injured very badly. And in response, Gucci absolutely handles the East Shoals boys by himself, or at least that's how he tells it. And then they never mess with him again. Gucci would graduate in 1998, and from there, he would take his hustle to a whole new level. And along the way, his past passion for music would lead him to the studio. Inspired by Tupac, Spice One, and Master P, Gucci Man would try to start his career. A friend of his would connect him with a young man named Xavier Dodson. He had just moved to East Atlanta from San Francisco and was looking for artists to make beats for. And quickly he would find out that Gucci is the perfect fit. But it wasn't that easy. At first, Xavier was making West Coast beats. And let's be honest, no one in the South wants to listen to E-40. So Xavier would switch up his style to fit the region, and that's when history is made, 2005. 
Gucci and Xavier, who's now known as Zaytoven, have been working together for a while. And in the studio one day, a magical beat starts playing. The So Icy Beat. And this is where two worlds collide. Young Jeezy hops on the first verse, and Gucci hops on the second. And boom, they have the song of the year. Now mind you, before So Icy, both Gucci and Jeezy were already the biggest underground rappers in Atlanta. So Jeezy's CTE label and Gucci and Zaytoven coming together was monumental. But this is when things instantly fall apart. Young Jeezy reportedly gets upset about not getting money from the song, and truly, he wanted the song on his album. But Gucci wanted to keep the song for himself. So Jeezy offers to pay Zaytoven a ton of money. Now mind you, at the time, Zaytoven is still living in his parents' house while cutting hair. And rumors say that Jeezy and Def Jam offered him a big bag. Like serious, life-changing money. But Zaytoven's loyalty ran with the guy that he's been working with for years. Honestly, that shows something about his character. The money did not change his loyalty and Jeezy was pissed off. So behind closed doors, Jeezy would allegedly start bad talking about Gucci. And trust me, Gucci does not like to be played with. But this split would go public when young Jeezy goes to the studio and records a song called Stay Strapped. In the song, he puts a $10,000 bounty on Gucci's chain. Now it's time for Gucci to respond. But instead of getting in the booth, he would do an interview where he does not hold back. The end and make you feel this way that you feel right now. They tried to get it, get my song on his album. I think he couldn't do it. You know what I mean? Just came out of it. So what he start doing exactly? You know, it's just making dish ruffles. It's going on the radio saying you know what I'm saying? Popping to the and shit. Was he doing that in Atlanta or in markets that you might not have been in? You going to markets I ain't been in yet and do a show before I get there uh -huh. and tell them don't buy my record when it come out. You actually heard that cats are saying like, don't buy fuck. Gucci out. I seen on videotape. Mm. So that what made me just flip out like this. May 10th, 2005. Gucci is at a girl's house in Panthersville, located only a couple minutes down from East Atlanta. They're sitting back chilling when they hear a boom. Five men run inside and this is where things get crazy. The men want one thing, Gucci's chain, but he's not having it. Bang! What just happened? Well, nobody would know, not even the police. That's because they wouldn't receive a single call about anything in the area. Two days later, May 12th, 2005. Columbia Middle School ends their school day and the kids go play in the area. A group of 7th graders decide to walk through the woods and that's where they find something they wish they never saw. So they call the police and the man is identified as Henry Clark III of Macon, Georgia. This would have the police extremely confused. What was this man from Macon doing in Panthersville? So they contact the family and find out that he's a rapper signed to Young Jeezy's CTE label. And once they find this out, all eyes are pointed in one direction. But it would be a little while before they would gather enough to officially name him as a suspect. Because remember, at this point, all they have is a body and nothing else. Everything else was cleaned up very well. But that would change on May 19th, 2005. Gucci is officially a wanted man. He decides to turn himself in later in the day. The news breaks out and everyone is in shock, even Zato. He had no clue that this happened, but claims that he could tell something was weighing on Gucci's mind, so it ended up making sense. At his first appearances, Gucci pleads his innocence, claiming self-defense. But the prosecution is not buying it, and this right here should be a lesson to everyone. Listen closely. The reason that they weren't buying it is because of everything that happened after the incident. Number one, why didn't Gucci call the police directly after if he's innocent? And more importantly, why was the area wiped of all evidence? This right here is the worst thing you can possibly do if you want to claim self-defense. You always need to be the one to call first and present your side before anyone else can. And this huge mistake would have things looking really bad for him. Meanwhile, Young Jeezy is taking full advantage of all the media coverage. And two months later on July 26, 2005, Young Jeezy releases his debut album, Thug Motivation 101. This album absolutely takes over the South and eventually the whole country. Songs like Soul Survivor, My Hood, and Air Forces all become anthems in every club. But behind the music labels and radio stations, things have gotten serious in Atlanta. Gucci does an interview after being released on Bond and he says some questionable things. He may have broken the code. What do you guys think? Check it out. So that situation that we were just talking about with the charges and so forth, do you feel like it was a setup because cats came like after you, like they was coming to get you? Yeah, I thought it was a setup. Do you have any like, you know, indications on who it might be? Have you heard anything on the streets? Just whatever you feel in your own heart? 
Well, you know what I'm saying? Like I say, ain't too many people got the motive to do shit like that. I just like a detective, learn, you know what I'm saying? Look at the motive, who has motive to do it. Mm. And this mm. don't think has motive. Mm. Jeezy. Yeah. Right up. Well, young Jeezy absolutely believes that Gucci broke the code and he wouldn't hold back. It's for any hood, no If you get in any type of trouble and a throw your name in that shit, he's a snitch ass. You know what I'm saying? He got me lucked up, got a song, got on. Now you want to talk crazy. You know what I'm saying? You can't do that. Things start looking really bad for Gucci's future. And this is for two reasons. Number one is that Jeezy and T.I. are his enemies, and that means that the fans are taking sides. And this wouldn't be a problem, except for the fact that Jeezy and T.I. are signed to major labels and have the whole industry behind them. Meanwhile, Gucci and Zaytoven are just two guys making hits out of their basement. And not only would this hinder their growth, Gucci's case has his future looking dim. The prosecutors have the perfect case. They show that evidence was tampered with after the incident, along with the failure to alert authorities. And here's the worst part for Gucci. He has no eyewitnesses, not even the girl he was with. And that right there makes you wonder whose side she was really on. But as things are looking downhill, a key witness shows up to court. A gardener who claims that they were mowing the lawn while everything transpired. The gardener would say that it was self-defense and that he saw it all go down. And that is all he needed. In January 2006, all charges would be dropped against Gucci. But to this day, no one truly knows what happened other than Gucci, the girl, and the four men involved. Oh yeah, and the gardener too, of course. That takes us to the year 2006. Gucci is back free and working harder than ever before. He and Zaytoven are literally spending every night in the studio and dropping banger after banger. Gucci's career would take off with hit songs like Wasted and Lemonade. But he wouldn't be the only one taking off. Young Jeezy would drop hit albums The Inspiration and The Recession. But just because his music is selling does not mean that everything is going well. Sadly, Young Jeezy would face an unfortunate situation. His friend and business partner Demetrius Ellerby claims that he owes him $5 million. The claims say that Jeezy failed to pay him for executive producing his albums. Ultimately, Demetrius feels entitled to half of Young Jeezy's profits. This was unexpected to say the least, and Young Jeezy must have felt blindsided. He would file a counter lawsuit claiming that he and Ellerby were never friends, and he would say that they never agreed to split profits from his music. So how did this turn out? Well, Young Jeezy would win the case because he was able to prove that there was never a written agreement to share any profits. So thankfully, he was able to keep his money. But after all, it seems that many of the issues in Jeezy's life occurred about money. But I guess that's just the life of a successful man. Now let's talk about the new Gucci, because after coming home in 2016, he became a new man. He changed so much that people began thinking that he's a clone of his former self. And they say time heals all wounds, and that may be the case. Gucci and Jeezy would finally agree to sit down under one condition. They would decide to do a versus battle to finally make it water under the bridge. The 2020 versus battle. Despite all the time passed, the tensions in the room were very high. And that would only get worse when Gucci would diss Jeezy's friend and former artist Pookie Lok. This right here was a wild decision by Gucci because this versus was meant to let bygones be bygones. And honestly, I found it amazing that young Jeezy just let it go. Lil Boosie would even go on Vlad TV and say that if it were him, it would have been a serious problem right then and there. But what do you guys think? Did Jeezy show growth and maturity or should he have reacted strongly? All in all, the verses truly showed how legendary both artists are and how many hits they really have. But for me, it showed that Jeezy is a more complete artist. But what do you guys think? Which artist was more influential to you? And that's gonna do it for this episode of Swamp Stories. Make sure to leave a like and subscribe and let me know in the comments what you want to see next. Peace!